One of the questions astronomers have asked for a very long time is what powers the stars? Where actually do they get their energy, their light, their heat? Um, they look like they live forever. Uh, we now know that stars do not live forever, um, but they live for a very, very, very long time. So what actually is the source of all the light and the heat that we get from our sun? The original hypothesis that a physicists and astronomers came up with many years ago was the concept of gravitational potential energy converted into kinetic energy. Now if you've never taken a physics course these terms might be a little bit different for you and you may not be familiar but the idea is pretty familiar. The classic example is something that is placed on a high hill or a rock or on the roof. And let's say you've got an object that's got a lot of mass and it's sitting on top of a roof. Right here it contains what we refer to in physics as potential energy. Now potential energy means it can do something. It has the potential to to exert some energy onto someone else. It can actually, it has the potential to make something move. That's part of the definition of energy and work. Now the rock sitting up there, if we've got a little caveman down here and he's under the rock, yes he has the right to be nervous because if something makes that rock, rock tip and the rock tips over and comes down and crashes on top of him, it will hurt and it will hurt a lot. And the reason it will is because the potential energy will be converted into kinetic energy. Kinetic means motion. And the fact that this rock was very, very, very high up here gives it the potential to be traveling very, very quickly when it hits my little caveman on the head and that could cause lots and lots of damage. So potential energy is actually the energy of position. That's what the definition of potential energy is. It's the energy of position. Kinetic energy is actually the energy of motion. And these two types of energy will actually flow back and forth over and over and over again. You can have position converted to motion and motion converted back into position. The classic example of this is a roller coaster. The top of a roller coaster hill you have lots of potential energy. You're very very high but you're not moving very fast. The bottom of the first roller coaster hill you're going very very quickly and you have energy of motion. So you have speed. Here you have position and here you have speed. Up to the top of the next hill you convert speed back for position and as the ride continues you are constantly trading off position or potential energy for speed kinetic energy for position potential energy for speed kinetic energy and that's how all roller coasters are powered. Once they give you your initial energy at the top of the roller coaster ride it's a free ride. You are freewheeling until they stop you down at the end of the ride. So why am I going on so much about this concept of kinetic energy and potential energy? Well, we're talking about our sun. For astronomers for a lot of years, they were trying to figure out where does the sun get its heat and where does it get its light? And here was the idea. The idea was that when the sun actually was produced, half a, a 5 billion years ago, 4.5 billion years ago, there were lots and lots and lots of pieces of dust and debris that were way out in a nebula. As these part, So these particles all had lots of potential energy because they were a long way away from our star. We talked about how much speed something would gain if it just fell off of a cliff or a roof down on the head of my caveman. Imagine one little grain of dust going from the outer solar system, the outer solar system, all the way in multiple, multiple millions of miles until it got to the sun. So the potential energy it possessed out here would trade into massive amounts of kinetic energy at the star. What was actually just position, because it was a long way away, here when it hit the star would give lots of heat and lots and lots of light. Astronomers did the math and they figured that this process, just the gases from the outer solar system condensing down into the star, could account for about 50 million years of thermal or heat energy in our sun. 
And we believe that this is truly where our star got its original heating. It was this collapse of the gas, lots of potential energy into kinetic. But we are pretty certain due to lots of different observations that our star is 4.5. Whoa, hello, what happened? <laughs> Sorry here. That our star is about 4.5 billion years old. Well, if our star is 4. Point, oops, sorry, 4.5 billion years old, then how the heck is this going to account for um, what's going on? Well, how this is going to account for that is that's not the old, the only or entire story. All right, and aha, got that figured out. Here's the rest of the story. The rest of the story is due to a fellow named Albert Einstein, and I know you've heard of Einstein. Einstein is, if you asked anybody out there in the world to name a physicist, they're going to name Einstein. Excuse me. <coughs> so we're going to talk just really, really briefly about Einstein because he's the one who actually figured out where this star energy actually came from. Um, Albert Einstein was born in Germany in 1879 through 1955. He died in the U.S. Um, I'm not going to ask you dates. You do not have to know the dates, but it's nice to hold the story together. Einstein got a degree in physics and a PhD in physics, but he had a wife and he had some young children. And he, Einstein is a very modern man. Um, he had to support the family. And he was also kind of, he was a little bit cocky. Uh, he did not go to class. He did not go to a lot of lectures because he knew he was the intellectual superior of a lot of the people who were trying to teach him. And so he just plain got some bad grades now and then because he just could skip all of his classes and then show up and kind of ace the tests. Um, after he got his degree, because of his attitude, quite honestly, he could not get a job in the world of physics, and so he got a job as a patent clerk, meaning someone would apply for a patent for a new gizmo, and he would look at it and see if it was a viable idea and pass it or not pass it. Einstein later said that this was a wonderful gift because it freed his mind to be creative by having a job that was moderately mindless and didn't require an awful lot of his intellect. So he, during that time that he was a patent clerk, he actually wrote numerous papers, we'll talk about in a few minutes, that really revolutionized science. Eventually he became famous. Um, he taught in Germany until Nazis actually came to power. And as a German Jew, Einstein was potentially going to be murdered by Hitler and the Nazi regime. And so he actually came to the United States, became a physics professor at the university um, in New Jersey, where Princeton is located, um, married his cousin Elsa after divorcing his first wife, Maleva, and like I said, modern kind of guy, and lived out his life in New Jersey. So let's talk a little bit about what Einstein has accomplished. Einstein created um, five absolutely revolutionary ideas in physics in what is referred to as Einstein's miracle year. This was in 1905, so well over 100 years ago. Einstein actually published five papers that changed how we view the universe. So the first one was he actually proved atoms existed um, using some mathematics and some modeling and things like that. Prior to Einstein, in 1905, so less than 120 years ago, we were still debating the idea of atoms. Now, if you know somebody who is 90 years old, 100 years old, and you might have some, uh, some elderly relatives, realize that when they were children, the idea of atoms was still revolutionary and kind of new, and it was still being debated in 1905. Um, Einstein proved their existence. Einstein proved something which is called Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the random motion of particles. The best example of this is if you spray perfume in one room of the house and many minutes later the the droplets of that fragrance come down and you can smell them in another room of the house. My house, I usually am opening a can of cat food and within two minutes the cat has appeared next to me because she has smelled the tuna fish and decided that she needs to be part of this. But that random motion of particles, 
is Brownian motion. And you cannot explain random motion of particles until you believe in atoms. The other three things that Einstein came up with are more famous. First one is the idea of special relativity. Special relativity are the concept that space and time are, are terribly intertwined. Um, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. And this is the idea that time can flow faster or slower if you are near something that is a large gravitational body. For example, if you've ever seen the movie Interstellar, they talk about relativistic time and things like that. We will talk more about this idea when we get to our topic of black holes, because black holes really mess with time and distance. The other thing Einstein came up with is the concept of the photoelectric effect. The photoelectric effect is how he explained why solar power devices work. You have a particular kind of, of chip. Very often it's made of selenium and light photons hit it and it produces electricity. That electricity then can be used to power a watch, a calculator, solar panels, and things like that. We would have no solar devices without Albert Einstein. And the one that we're going to talk about in this section right here is E equals mc squared. This is the most famous equation in all of physics, and it says that E energy can be converted directly into mass and vice versa. Energy can become mass and mass can become energy. This is the process via which stars produce light. So we're going to end right here and we're going to come back and continue this concept of energy and light in the next video.